We're extremely fortunate to have Devin Brownstein here from the Illinois Office of Broadband. Devin, thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about breaking down a historic moment for universal broadband access in Illinois. Take it away, um, Devin. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Adam, and thanks everyone for having me. I think this might be my third Shy Hack Night. Uh, previous to my current role, I was with the city of Chicago doing very similar work. So excited to be here for the first time in my new capacity, leading the state's uh, broadband and digital equity work. Um, so I will jump into it and share my screen. All right, hopefully that looks good for folks. I'll, I'll assume yes. Uh, so again, good. great. Um, and hope my power doesn't go out. It's gotten some crazy storms around here. Not sure if others are experiencing the same, but we will hope for the best. Um, so today I'm going to talk about statewide digital equity, uh, breaking down a historic moment for universal broadband access in Illinois. And so I'd like to start this presentation a little bit differently with a photo of my 97 year old grandpa, my pop up Millard. Um, and you might be wondering why I'm starting the presentation like this. This might not have, have been what you expected, um, but I will tell you why. So he is digital equity goals. Uh, this is a photo of my pop up Millard on a telehealth appointment with his cardiologist just from this past weekend. Uh, so what is happening in this picture is uh, my dad and I had taken his blood pressure, taken his pulse from home, uploaded this to an online portal from his health facility. Then the doctor called him on video over Wi-Fi using his device to check in on how he's doing after a recent procedure. This was all from home so he could avoid going into the hospital, avoid the big COVID surge going on right now and, and expending too much energy traveling back and forth. Um, and then after all of this, he uh, was able to use his device to FaceTime his kid, my aunts, who were eagerly awaiting the outcome of the presentation. Um, so just a really great example of what we can all achieve if everyone has access to quality home internet, that they can afford a device to actually use that internet and the skills and confidence that they need to achieve these larger outcomes that internet access just enables us to achieve. So with that, here's an agenda. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the Illinois Office of Broadband does and who we are. Then I'll break down the two buckets of historic funds coming to Illinois that uh, starts with broadband infrastructure and then we'll go into digital equity. I'll talk through next steps, how you can stay in touch, get involved, and then I will take questions. So first, a little bit about who we are. Um, so I joined the Office of Broadband back in December. We are an office within a state agency, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, or DCEO. Our office uh, manages grants as well as leads community engagement efforts, and we're currently bulking up our policy arm as well. The office was founded back in 2019 when not many states had broadband offices. But thanks to the programs I will talk through shortly, now every, every single state and territory has some sort of broadband office working on all of this. So it is a really exciting time to be working in the space. We also have a really neat collaboration with the University of Illinois. Um, they have stood up an organization called the Illinois Broadband Lab that contributes capacity through mapping and data, dashboards, research, community engagement. Uh, so together we kind of make up the Illinois broadband operation. A cool thing about what Illinois offers as it relates to broadband access is that it's not just getting people connected. It's not just spreading awareness. It's not just digital inclusion programming. It's really a cradle to grave, full life cycle of access. So what does that include? First, local planning. We have programs to help communities understand their needs as it relates to broadband, as it relates to the landscape, identifying the right partner or the right provider, and then actually taking that into action. Then we focus on broadband deployment, which has been um, a bulk of the work over the past several years. So this means mainly deploying capital grants to help deploy 
uh, broadband infrastructure to homes that don't currently have high speed internet or infrastructure that can achieve the speeds that we consider broadbands. And then finally, there's this equity piece. So how do we make sure that once someone does have broadband available to them, that they actually know what speeds work for them, that they know how to call a provider and sign up for a package that works for them, and then they can use that service to, again, achieve those outcomes. So when we're talking about the internet, it's not the end goal. It's really just a conduit to achieve all of these other things, whether it's seeing your doctor and staying healthy, to doing homework online, enrolling in classes, applying for jobs, and so much more. I'm sure you all um, have many examples in your head already. Um, so just to briefly touch upon what we mean by planning, there is an awesome program that has been run in partnership with our office, but led by the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. They bring together these 16-week community broadband planning cohorts with a cohort of county governments um, where they tap individual leaders in those county governments. They do a big survey of their residents. They look at the data. They study what service is currently available, where are their gaps, and what kind of provider, what sort of characteristics would we look for in a provider to help meet our community's needs. So really starting from you know, little to no knowledge of broadband and access, um, tapping into residents' needs and experiences, and helping these counties really become empowered to chart their own broadband future. Then comes broadband deployment. So the initiative that our office has uh, been running for the past several years is called Connect Illinois. It is uh, capital funding going towards broadband deployment, essentially grants to get households high-speed internet. So it's typically um, deployed to either an internet service provider, or sorry, granted to an internet service provider. Um, some of our grants go to local governments in partnership with a provider. There's a match portion to make sure that that applicant has skin in the game. Um, and then we work with them to actually deploy the broadband over the next couple of years. So this has included internet service providers, local governments, public schools were also an eligible entity. Um, and the goal is to provide access to unserved or underserved locations. And I'll talk about those definitions shortly. But you can see some fun articles over on the right um, to show how you know, communities are getting really excited about this long needed connectivity. And finally, equitable access. I'll talk about kind of the big things on the horizon, but thus far, I think the DEC program is a really great example of supporting and building capacity among local organizations who already have that trust. They already have these best practices going as it relates to serving communities and connecting them to digital scale building classes, um, affordable internet plans. So the Digital Equity Capacity Kickstarter grant program is geared towards small grants, whether it's seed grants or helping these small community-based organizations be sustainable in the services that they're offering to help connect folks on the ground to broadband and digital skills. So that's kind of where we've been. And now I'd love to shift to where we are going and really where we're on the precipice right now. Um, historic federal funding coming to Illinois. So Illinois is not alone in this. There was a $42 billion investment thanks to the Biden administration through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, um, investing in both broadband infrastructure as well as digital equity. So I don't think that the word digital equity had been in a federal bill before this. Um, so a really exciting time for advocates who had been pushing the need for this for um, many, many years before this. So I'll first talk about that infrastructure uh, side of the coin. BEAD is a $42 billion federal grant program and its goal is to bring connectivity to everyone in the US and US territories. It stands for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program um, and every state was allocated an amount uh, based on the amount of uh, potentially eligible households that they have. So a couple of example uses for these funds, they'll mainly be spent on the deployment of high-speed internet. Um, they could also be spent on upgrading infrastructure to get to those speeds that are acceptable based on the program. 
Uh, community anchor institutions are also eligible to receive service, and that could be a school or a library, um, a public housing community. It also includes installing internet in multi-dwelling units. So making sure that we're not just bringing connectivity to the front door of an apartment building, but actually getting that quality connectivity to every single unit at speeds um, that are at the acceptable level of what we consider broadband. So a little bit more of a deep dive into what BEAD means for Illinois. Illinois was allocated $1.04 billion to connect all unserved and underserved households to broadband over the next five years. So what does this actually look like? Our goal is to ensure universal coverage, um, and we have to maximize the use of end-to-end -end fiber, which some of you may know, fiber is kind of this future-proof technology, has a lifespan of roughly 50 years, um, is known as, as kind of that best-in-class technology, but it is expensive. And so that is why this program um, exists and is here to kind of help get fiber to areas where the market may not have previously gone based on a return on investment that didn't make business sense for them. Um, so we'll have to prioritize projects based on their level of need in terms of connectivity. Um, all projects will have to have a low cost broadband affordability plan and a middle class affordability option. And then there are really specific timelines set by the federal government. Uh, the Department of Commerce agency that is administering this program is called NTIA. National Telecommunications and Information Administration. So kind of everything that we're doing has an Illinois spin on it, um, but is governed by these NTIA processes. So breaking down the numbers here, and I think this is really interesting to see because it shows kind of how this program defines access and defines someone being served. So uh, the BEAD program requires us to confirm whether every location in the state is either served, underserved, or unserved. Um, so you can see kind of here the spread of uh, how each location is classified with the big disclaimer that this is subject to change as we incorporate our latest data. So you can see there are roughly 107,000 unserved broadband locations. This means that their speeds are below 25 over three megabits per second, um, which has until a couple months ago, that was the definition of broadband that the FCC had set. So these households are top priority based on the federal requirements. Then the next tier is underserved. These are households that might have access to 25 over three speeds, but not quite 100 over 20 speeds, which is the new requirement, um, the new definition that the FCC has set for broadband. So this totals roughly 170,000 households, again, subject to change, um, that we are required to serve through this billion dollar allocation. Then this leaves roughly 4 million served BSLs. And if this number looks high, uh, I want to kind of dig into what served means. So I know, you know, this is Shy Hack Night. We have a Chicago audience, and this was an issue that was very near and dear to my heart in my previous role with the city of Chicago. Just want to acknowledge just because something is served uh, by definition, it just means that it has some option available to that household. What this definition doesn't include is adoption. So is the available service affordable to that household? Um, is the available service accessible to that household in terms of, you know, does the customer service representative speak their native language so they can sign up for it and ask the questions that they need? Do, does this household have outstanding debt with the provider that's now preventing them from signing up for the low cost plan? So I think it's really important to acknowledge that the BEAD program is huge for infrastructure around Illinois, uh, but it doesn't solve the entire affordability problem for folks like many in Chicago who do have access uh, to some service, but it doesn't mean that that service works for them um, or is accessible or affordable to them. So an equally as important issue uh, but kind of separate and as important to what the, the challenge that the BEAD program kind of gets at directly. And I'm happy to kind of talk through um, what solutions to that might look like as well. So I kind of went over this, but just to uh, reiterate here, we are covering households in this priority order. So one is those unserved locations, 
two is underserved. And then the third priority are community anchor institutions like you see listed here that do not have access to gigabit symmetrical service, which is the same thing as say saying 1000 over 1000 megabits per second. Um, so our goal is to capture this entire um, audience of eligible locations. The only thing that will impact our ability to do that is seeing how far those dollars get us. Once we enter our sub-grantee selection process, where we essentially solicit bids from qualified internet service providers or public-private partnerships uh, to serve those locations. And finally, I think coming to the end of this section, um, there's been a lot of questions on who actually applies for these funds. You know, if I'm a part of a community and I know we haven't had access or our access has been speeds of two, um, do I have to do anything? And so the answer is that the entities who will be applying for these funds directly are those that are going to be actually deploying broadband. So we'll be looking for entities that have experience deploying broadband or a public-private partnership where, where maybe a local government or a nonprofit's involved, um, but they're paired up with some kind of internet service provider who does have that experience. So you can kind of see in this graphic what examples of deployment looks like. And finally, um, this is a high-level overview of the timeline that we're working on. So this whole process started back in early 2023, before I was a part of this office. Um, and we, as a state, have gone through a series of federal requirements. This is a lot of funding, and so it requires a lot of really close planning and due diligence to make sure that every state is using these funds um, to the best and most maximized efficient way. But we are getting quite close to our uh, green light to actually launch our application where internet service providers will then apply for these funds. We'll go through a scoring criteria, a couple of waves of applications. And then the goal is that by next June, we'll have what's called a final proposal where we can actually start um, executing agreements with these providers. And then four years later, um, all of these households that do not currently have service will have service. So it is a long-term um, journey that we're on, but we are inching closer and closer. All right, so second section here is that uh, sort of part two. Once you have the connection, how do you make sure that uh, folks know how to adopt broadband, the importance of broadband, and that they have the skills and support and resources to actually use it? So enter the Digital Equity Act. Before we dive into what the act actually is, I mentioned digital equity a couple of times, but I did want to make sure that we were defining it. You might remember this definition if you were on any of my previous presentations, um, but it really carries forth through everything that we do. Um, so here to emphasize that the work is not just about broadband deployment, but making sure that the broadband is accessible, affordable, and successfully reaches communities who need it most and who have those historic um, disinvestments or barriers to achieving access to connectivity. So digital equity, like equity itself, is both an outcome and a process. As an outcome, it's the state that we're trying to reach, where everyone, particularly those with the greatest historic barriers, have access to the connectivity, devices, and skills they need to participate in Illinois' modern economy and thrive, um, specifically with making sure that community members with the greatest barriers are at the table. And that kind of leads us into digital equity as a process. It's how we do business day to day. We're not making decisions behind closed doors in an ivory tower. We are working hand in hand, side by side with end users, communities most impacted by these issues. So I mentioned the Digital Equity Act. Here's kind of a breakdown of what it is. Um, the Digital Equity Act is also administered through the federal agency NTIA. It uh, nationwide provides $2.75 billion to create three, <clears throat> three grant programs that promote digital equity and inclusion. The first was a state planning grant. So every state had the opportunity to build a digital equity plan following statewide listening tours, surveys, telephone surveys, 
to get a baseline understanding of what are the current barriers to connectivity, what are the assets that we already have in place that we can scale, build upon, learn from, and how do we kind of combine both of these things to create really specific key performance indicators, goals, and baselines that we are trying to build upon so we know where do we want to be in five years when this funding program has ended. So Illinois did that, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. The capacity grant is really exciting because it is funding specific to our state. So every state gets a capacity grant. And because Illinois has a high proportion of populations who are priority in this program, uh, we're getting up to $40 million over the next five years. So a really exciting opportunity for us to be building capacity among local stakeholders to implement our digital equity plan. So when I'm talking about what the state's doing, much, much of it falls under the capacity grant because this is kind of what we have control over. And then second, there's a grant called a competitive grant. Uh, the application is open right now. This is a grant that our office is kind of on the sidelines for. Um, it is directly from NTIA. And the goal is to fund kind of big regional or statewide digital inclusion projects. So if you're interested in learning more about that, happy to chat about that. Uh, later or offline as well. So this is our digital equity plan. It was approved back in April, which was a big milestone in our kind of bureaucratic steps that we have to uh, achieve. And so our digital equity plan will chart really the next five plus years in how we achieve digital equity um, and implement these dollars. So this is a snapshot of the kind of core activities that all of the work is bucketed within. We'll have a public dashboard, we'll have a grant program, we'll work with partners, build communities of practice, lots of initiatives to kind of bring together that statewide digital equity ecosystem and lift folks up with the resources that they need to keep doing what they're doing and scale and grow in areas of the state that don't currently have those resources. So I talked a little bit about equity and process, and I wanted to share this example of how we have kind of lived up to that principle um, in the past couple of months since our plan's approval. So we have uh, proposed to use a pretty decent uh, subset of the funds that we are getting this year to launch a multi-year digital equity grant program for community-based organizations, local governments, and nonprofits to kind of build their own and grow their own programs around digital access. So that could be digital skill building, coalition building, um, connecting folks with affordable computers, free device giveaways, things like that, and trying to incorporate those resources into spaces that already have connections um, and trusted relationships with community members. So all they have to do is kind of enter this digital equity focused, you know, training or broadband access component to those relationships uh, to connect folks with those additional tools that they need to achieve, you know, whatever they were setting out to achieve. So we wanted to make sure that the grant program that we launch actually makes sense for those who are going to be applying for it. Um, and so we had some time before we knew we would get awarded our funds um, from NTIA. So we held a series of co-design sessions or co-creation co sessions. Um, we went around the state, we hosted virtual meetings and basically said, here's what we're thinking for the grant program. Here are eligible categories, expenses. Here's how we might measure success. Here's how we might evaluate applications. Um, and we took that to these stakeholders who we anticipate will be applying for the grant and ask them to weigh on weigh in on pretty specific elements of the grant program. So uh, following, um, I don't know, I think more than 30, 30 to 40 of these sessions, we are now kind of churning together the results and incorporating it into that final notice of funding opportunity, which we are trying to push out in early fall. And I mentioned this briefly, but um, Everything that we do under the Digital Equity Act will require the prioritization of covered populations. So um, this is kind of language directly from NTIA, but essentially all of the projects that we fund will have to prioritize and serve one or more of these identity groups. Um, and we have lots of covered populations in Illinois, 72% um, to be exact of Illinois residents are part of these communities. 
who are disproportionately impacted by digital equity. So we've got a lot of communities to serve and we're excited that we can kind of prioritize in this way. And just a little preview of some programs on deck. Um, so we've been having lots of capacity building workshops to support prospective applicants in doing things like grant writing, learning about how to navigate state systems. We know that, you know, applying for a state or federal grant can be really daunting and also challenging to meet all of the requirements, maintain this grant report. So we're trying to do what we can to connect folks to resources and provide that baseline level of knowledge um, so folks can be successful in their applications. We'll be hosting technical assistance throughout the application process. We'll have additional regional engagement opportunities, digital navigators around the state, and we'll be designing a statewide digital equity dashboard. So everything that we're doing and our progress in implementing the plan is transparent and public, but folks can also download data to tell their own story, advocate for funding, advocate for um, investments in this issue in their own communities. I know how hard it can be to make the case for funding for something that seems small compared to all of the other, you know, a really high priority emergency uh, programs that are happening, especially um, here in Chicago. And so data can be a really, really powerful tool paired with stories to help make the case for that. So with that, wanted to just flash up a couple of ways that you can stay in touch with our office. Um, we have an intake form and you can provide your contact information, select what you're interested in hearing about, and then you will hear about those things and opportunities for webinars, events, or uh, grant programs. Um, for the BEAD program, you know, if you're not an internet service provider, there's still a really important way that you can be involved. And that is by showing local support for a project that you are supportive of. Um, so this is not required. And if anyone sort of makes you feel like it is required, it is not. Um, but this is an opportunity for us as the office when we're evaluating programs to understand, you know, has this provider done their due diligence, built relationships with the community? Um, because that tells us that it'll be sustainable and it's also equitable. Um, if you are, you know, interested in the BEAD program, there are wet webinars happening weekly starting tomorrow, um, and then the formal application will be coming out likely in mid to late October. So uh, I have our website there, but I can also share that in the chat or after the fact, and that is another great way to follow along. And so with that, I am happy to take any questions. That was fabulous, Devin, and, and uh, ambitious in the most positive way possible, I can say that. Um, some really great programs there. And we do have some questions from your audience, so I'm going to uh, read them to you. Uh, the first question is, from the makeup of the Illinois Broadband Office Board to the federal bead funding, it seems that everything's oriented towards telecommunication giants and large providers. As I recall, a BEAD recipient has to provide over 50% of the funding. I don't see many programs really oriented to neighborhoods and small providers. Please comment. Care to comment? Of course. Um, I think the mindset around BEAD is that it is a hugely ambitious program, and it will only work if the program is accessible and every provider is at the table and has the opportunity to go after these funds. So I'll touch upon a couple of things. Um, the 25% 20, 25 match requirement, there's a couple of you know, loopholes, if you will. Um, one is that if there is a really high cost location, it's hard to serve, and it doesn't make business sense to be putting forth that 25% 20, capital investment, there is a waiver process. And Illinois fully intends on using that, particularly as we're getting into our final wave if there are areas that either have no bids um, or just getting really little interest, we'll kind of use all the tools in our toolkit to make sure that at the end of the day, there is a provider um, who makes sense for that location. Um, yeah. I'll also say that, so 10% of the points awarded in our application scoring rubric are for, are for local coordination. Um, so, a big giant might not be able to demonstrate that it has had a longstanding relationship with a community. So for local coordination, we're not looking for just 20 letters of support. We're looking for 
breadth and depth and meaningful evidence that a provider has engaged with a community. So a letter of support that is really genuine from a local business, a local library, that's one example. We also want to see that an applicant understands local processes, maybe has a relationship with the local Department of Transportation or mayor, um, understands how to get you know, easements, meaning access to um, privately owned land to build their broadband. So there's a lot of opportunities for a smaller provider to kind of level up in terms of their application and be competitive against some of the bigger folks. We need the bigger folks too, but again, looking for that really diverse pool. I will also yes, say we um, one more point. We we ran a pre qualification process to kind of get a sense for early interest um, and help folks early on pull together materials that they will need during the formal application process. And this is something else that will help make going through that process more accessible for smaller folks that might not have their own federal affairs and policy teams. Um, and we saw really strong participation from electric co ops, um, small rural providers local providers who are just like based in a town, they're providing service to the town they grew up in. Um, so we have lots of examples, you know, while it is admittedly not an easy thing to participate in BEAD, lots of kind of examples that are pointing us in the right direction. And it sounds like you're giving a lot of opportunities for local advocates to demonstrate some agency. Um, speaking of providers, has the state considered offering a public option internet service provider or municipal internet options to serve these households and establishments and dot, 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 why not? So the good thing about the BEAD program is that any entity that can demonstrate its ability to deploy broadband to households is eligible. That could be an internet service provider that's been in existence for 20 years, um, or it could be a local government. And we have a couple of current Connect Illinois grantees who are local governments pairing up with internet service providers to offer that internet. So I would say municipal applicants are, you know, encouraged to apply um, and we wanna support them in making sure that they're competitive in the application process. Terrific. Um, this is an interesting one. Has the state considered conducting training classes at libraries throughout the state to train folks on how to install and use broadband like Apple did at the retail locations with its iPhones? And I, I, I seem to remember that we that there was this was something that was done in the past. Is there plans for doing this statewide? Yes. So this is something that's happening currently. And the hope is that with our digital equity statewide grant program, which will be called the Illinois Digital Capacity Grant Program or Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program, is that we will fund local organizations to run classes like this whether it's in libraries, whether it's in community centers, housing authorities, any space where folks are already gathering and already kind of feel as accessible and safe to them, um, offering a class like that. And I love the Apple model. Like I'm remembering when they had the classes and everyone sitting, sitting on the stools and participating. Um, I think that's exactly what we are trying to do. And Kathy, I'm not sure where you live, but I'm happy to kind of link you up with some nonprofits who might be doing work like that right now. Yeah, libraries are centers of civic activity, but they're not the only centers of civic activity in a lot of regions. So it's great to hear that you're opening this up a little bit. Um, next question, is there a system of accountability for these projects? An interesting question. And their timelines that differ from previous federal broadband initiatives like the Telecommunications Act and various rural broad broadband appropriations that have had dubious results? Yes. So this is a five-year program, and there are a lot of pretty strict accountability requirements, both on the state and then metrics that we'll have to pass through and collect uh, from our subrecipients, so from the folks actually deploying the broadband. Um, a couple of the metrics will include, you know, the number of households that you've deployed broadband to or passed, number of people connected, and then ideally, actually, the percentage of um, your past households that have signed on to your service and are paying customers. We also tie our funding to milestones. So we'll release funding if you can demonstrate that you ordered your equipment um, or that you deployed to 10%, 20% of locations, which is kind of a balance 
importance of accountability, but also not being so burdensome that, you know, folks are having to collect receipts for lots of different little payments in order to, um, in order to get that funding. I will also add that we're doing a lot of this work upfront. So looking closely at not just how much money are you asking for, but what is your business plan and what is your network design? And can you do what you are saying that you will do? So is your business, does your business plan make sense? Is it feasible? Um, is the amount of, are the amount of broadband serviceable locations captured in your network designs actually going to be connected at the speed threshold that we're expecting based on the technology that you have provided? So all of this is kind of done through the pre-qualifications, then the qualifications, which will be kind of a gating criteria for uh, an entity to even be considered for a grant. We are very aware of some programs that have not had um, positive results and are using that as a huge learning to make sure that this program doesn't make the same mistakes. And the entity that's evaluating that criteria is the Illinois Office of Broadband? So we'll be evaluated, but then we'll have to collect metrics from the grantees, which will be the internet service providers. So we have skin in the game. You know, we have uh, um, an incentive to make sure that the providers are doing what they committed to doing and that everyone's getting that connectivity um, because it's a statewide grant program at the end of the day. Fabulous. So there's somebody in, in the state that's holding feet to the fire. Uh, are there other questions, folks? Keep them coming while we have Devin. All right. If seeing no further questions, Devin, I just want to thank you for your for your third visit to Shy Hack Night in this capacity. This is your first one in this capacity. So thank you very much for um, talking about this, uh, like I said, very ambitious and uh, exciting program. And uh, Devin has just put the uh, contact form in the chat window. So hackers, please take a look at, uh, at that if you want to stay in touch with the Illinois Office of Broadband. And for the next section of Shy Hack Night, here come the thank yous all flying in for you. Uh, the mm -hmm. next section of Shy Hack Night at eight o'clock, we will start doing our introductions, our three word introductions. So if you can hang on, um, we're going to give until eight o'clock for folks who typically show up after the presentation to show up and we'll come back and do our intros and then go forth and hack. Devin, thank you again. We'll see you all in 12 minutes. Thanks so much. Have a good night, everyone.